Well, a um, little transition up here on stage, but I appreciate the, uh, the efforts of making all of this work. I saw it briefly. Yeah. Does that work for you guys over there? You like this angle? Is that... I'm hitting the cord there, aren't I? We'll give that a try. Yeah, it's still kind of new. Still kind of figuring things out as we, we do this. Hopefully it won't flash the whole time. How about we have a word of prayer? We'll see how it goes. Would you bow your heads with me? Gracious Heavenly Father, we just continue in a spirit of worship. We continue in a spirit of joy and of hope and of expectation. And Lord, uh, we just pray that you would uh, continue to send your spirit here. But we also know that the, the kids program is going on in the fellowship hall. And we, so we lift up our kids as well, Lord, that you would bless them in that special program and that you'd bless the volunteers that are uh, that are serving and helping out over there. So, Father, just uh, may your spirit be on this entire campus and uh, teach us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Yeah, if it keeps doing that, we may have to think about something else because that's kind of annoying, isn't it? A little, a little bit more of a distraction than a benefit, isn't it? Let's see what happens. At least we have the backup of the screen in the back, but thank you for being uh, tolerant and patient. And I don't know what else to do here. Don't just smile at me like that, Ben. You got to give me some feedback. <laughs> <laughs> don't touch it. Don't touch it. Remember the bunny ears that you used to, you know, you get it set. Don't touch it. See, you touched it. Yeah, <laughs> we got deceived. Maybe I should have said, touch it. Now you got to stay there. You got to stay there and smile the whole time. Yeah, don't look at it. See, you looked at it. You looked at it. All right, I'm going to go ahead and just shut it down. I think I am. Thank you. All right, we're still, we're still experimenting with things like that, but you can still see the screen though, right? All right, that's, that's the important thing. All right, I'm continuing in this uh, uh, series of looking at the wilderness uh, wanderings and the attitudes that we're experiencing, and, and uh, so it's just been kind of a, a theme we've been going through, and the negative attitude that we're looking at next is doubt, and so I put this uh, reference from Steps to Christ up here to, to begin to begin the discussion. Those who wish to doubt will have opportunity, while those who really desire to know the truth will find plenty of evidence on which to rest their faith. It really comes down to a choice. There will be those who, if you want to doubt, if you have made that your, your, uh, your default, uh, those possibilities are going to be there. But if you're really trying to understand and follow the Lord, He will give you plenty of evidence on which to rest your faith. You've heard of blind faith before, right? Or a leap of faith. And I'm not saying that there's not, you know, something worth looking at that there. But I will tell you this, that is not the norm in the Christian life. It is not the typical way that God comes into our life and just says, look, I just need you to jump with me and just trust I'm going to be there to catch you. Uh, that there are times when we just have to rely on the Lord and I, I, without very much to go on. I get that. But that is not the norm. God has given us enormous levels of evidence to, to trust Him, to know His plan, to know His love, to know His power. Uh, so the, 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 the kind of idea of blind faith or a leap of faith is really not a good way of looking at standard Christian faith. Um, but nor should that give us reason to say, well, then it's okay that we can live in doubt. So We'll get into this a little bit more. So what is a doubt? Is doubt even an attitude? We might think of it as a reaction or a response. But again, going right back to the beginning of, of, kind of trying to define and illustrate this, I defined attitudes as a settled 
pattern of thinking. There are people who just by nature, just by default, just their natural disposition is to be cynical, to be skeptical. No matter what you tell them, it's, eh, I'm not sure about that. And I'm not talking about being cautious. I'm not talking about, you know, wanting to have, you know, a good uh, 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 thoughtfulness before making a decision. But it's, it's almost like an Eeyore syndrome. It's almost like a, just a, a general uh, 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 operating of your mind where no matter what is said, you're just going to automatically say, I don't think that's true. I don't think that works. Now, there's a good part of this is, is sometimes in life. How many of you have ever seen a commercial or an ad for a revolutionary new diet product that all you do is take this pill and it's been clinically, scientifically proven, folks, you just take this pill and you don't need to exercise, you don't need to stop eating the chili fries, you just take this pill and in 24 hours you're going to look just like me. Well, maybe there is a pill for that. I don't know. <laughs> uh, no, but you, you, I see these all the time. There's this special powder that's been found, or we've, in the deep sea they've found this algae that you just do this and, and you just take this powder. Now, I think it's okay to doubt that, you know, because, again, you're, you're not talking about something that has enormous amounts of evidence. But there are those that no matter what, uh, they just, no matter what they hear, it's just like, ah, I'm not sure, I don't, I don't believe that. And that's what we're talking about here, especially as it relates to the plan of God. A settled pattern of thinking, of always putting God to the test. No matter how many times He's come, forward, uh, come forth for you in the past or, or, or succeeded in the past, you continually say, ah, I'm not sure He can do it this time, though. Settled patterns of thinking developed over long periods of time that are reflected in one's behavior. That's going to be the next challenge that the children of Israel face in the wilderness is doubt. And so that's where we want to get to. Now, the kids aren't here, and even a lot of our teens aren't here. I know that um, some of the boys uh, went out hiking and things like that. But if there are any young people here at all, does yellow suit you? You like yellow? Yellow working? Yes. And uh, anyone else? Just, I call this teen trivia. Any, any young people here at all? A few. Madison, I'm glad to see you today. Sorry to call you out like that, but I guess I'm not that sorry. <laughs> so there are a few young people here, and I would love to have your help. How many spies went to check out Canaan in Numbers 13? Do you know? I'm told how many. All right, A, B. I'm going to help get this so everyone can hear. Uh, Twelve. Oh, did, is the black? Say it nice and loud. Twelve. Yeah, twelve. That is right. One for each tribe. Now, it wasn't just 12 random Joes that were selected either. The Bible makes it clear these were leaders. These were leaders. I see, yeah. I see some parents elbowing their kids. Love it. That's what we love in church. <laughs> A leader from each tribe, so that's important. All right, how many of the spies were afraid and doubted God's ability to help them conquer the land? So 12 go out, but not all of them come back in faith and courage. How many of them doubt it? Uh, Emma's so excited. I saw her just jump up with excitement and enthusiasm. Do you want to you give it a try? <laughs> Dad says yes. All but two, so ten. <laughs> <laughs> the math skills are there. You are right. Ten. Ten came back. Ten of the leaders of Israel, ten of the leaders said, nah, uh this is looking pretty rough. Uh, we are not able to go up against the people. They are too strong for us. All right. Now, we're getting into it. What were the names of the two spies who were not afraid and trusted and trusted in the Lord? What were the names? Not just the number. We know there were two of them. What were their names? Any of the young people, teens, kids that are here? Come on, you know these names. All right, Emma, you can do it again. Joshua and Caleb. Joshua and Caleb, yeah. Names are now enshrined within Christian and... and uh, uh, you know, within tradition of just being names of great individuals. Caleb and Joshua was their names. The Lord is with us. Do not fear them. Number four, who did the people, or oh, I, I misspelled this. It should say what. What did the people want to do to Joshua and Caleb for their faith? Did they say, yay, Joshua and Caleb, we want to put you on a pedestal because you're so faithful? What did they say about Joshua and Caleb because of their faith? You remember what was their response? If I see some of you guys back here, come on now, don't let me down. Okay, Ezekiel. 
No, yeah, you did. You thought I was waving at you, but it's too late now. I'm all the way over here. What did they say? You got it. Come on. Yeah, yeah, it's right there. What did the people want to do? Shiloh, help, help. Yeah. Me? Yeah, Shiloh, help. Oh my goodness, I don't know about this next generation. I've got all kinds of concerns. It's that they were going to stone them with stones. I, I know the answer. Oh, Shiloh, oh, yes. I think the people wanted to uh, stone oh, Joshua. Oh, she is Caleb. so correct. She got it. I am impressed. You know, when put to the test, you come through, and that's awesome. Now, notice this democracy right, is happening here. And the two naysayers, not only were they say, did you lose, but uh, uh, you need to get out of here completely. It's time for you to be executed. They wanted to kill Joshua. Murderous uh, thoughts are coming into the camp here. Not good. Then the glory of the Lord appeared, similar to as it did in the previous story with Miriam and Aaron. It's like the Lord appeared and grabbed them all by the ear and said, settle down. Last question. Okay, won't, won't torture you too much more after this. And it's been awfully quiet on this side, but what was God's response or punishment for all the congregation doubting His plan and power and threatening the faithful? So when they were unable to move forward, what did God say is the result going to be? What's going to happen to Israel because they were unwilling to go into the promised land? Anyone remember? I'll give you a hint. They had to wander someplace for a period of time. Boy, we need the kids here, don't we? When we don't have the kids here, we just feel lost. All right, A.B. <laughs> they had to wander in the wilderness. For how many years? Forty. For 40 years. That was wonderful. You did it. Good job. Thank you, Nassim. Yeah, it's always a little different. We're kind of spread out now with uh, different programs going on on campus and, and different things happening, but still like to have that little bit of fun. Well, it's fun for me. I don't know about the rest of you. Fun for me to have this little time of trivia and, and just to get us into the story and remind us about what's going on. And I've been throwing this, uh, this idea out there for a while. I wanted to actually put the verse up. Moses tells us in Deuteronomy, it was an 11-day walk, 11 days from, from uh, uh, Mount Sinai to the southern borders of Canaan. So it's not like they were necessarily lost. It's that God had to take them to walk in circles for 40 years to get them to come to their senses in a, in a, in a way. And uh, it, it's one of the great stories. And again, just to remind you, Paul says in the New Testament that these people are the same as us, that their example is the same trial and the same example that we need to learn from. And so uh, uh, we, we can't distance ourselves too much and say, yeah, what a bunch of rebels. Well, you know, I'm so glad that's not anything that we would ever experience. In, in actuality, their story is our story. I've thrown this up a few times and just to show us where we're at. We've talked about these negative things, complaining, greeting, criticism. We're now all the way down to doubt. But we want to replace those. Again, it's not just enough to say, well, I'm going to not do those things. They actually need to be replaced with the positive attitudes. The answer to those bad attitudes are uh, thankfulness, contentment, love, and moving on in faith. And really, it's one or the other, right? And we want to be moving in the right direction. So we've looked at all of these. Oh, it's a short distance from doubt to despair. In the story that we're going to look at today, they go immediately from doubting God's ability and God's dad's plan immediately into rebellion. Doubt and despair or doubt and rebellion are our are, are two twin brothers that are just going to be uh, happening at almost the same time. It's a short journey from doubt to despair. So we want to move and, and move more in this direction here and be, uh, uh, learn from the negative examples of the children of Israel. So what is doubt? Yes, it's the absence of faith. We know that. That's a simple thing. But from a, a Christian and biblical perspective, doubt could be considered a lack of assurance regarding God's promises. It's not, an, it's not being ignorant of God's promises. Okay? That's a whole different thing. It's not to say, I don't know what God's plan is. Doubt is, I know what God's plan is. It's not that uh, I don't understand what His plan is. It's that I doubt God. 
Okay, do you see this? This is why this is more pervasive than just fleeting cautions and doubts that we might have about, you know, which college do I go to, this college or that college, or which job do I take, do I take, the, which house do I buy, or what, what do we do? Okay, there's all kinds of decisions that we make where we may not know precisely what God's plan is, but when we, when we know God's plan and we still hesitate, that's saying we're not sure of God. So it's lack of assurance regarding God's promise, lack of confidence in God, lack of trust or distrust in God's power, provision, and plan. All these things are there. To put it concisely in a statement, doubt is a settled or persistent choice to live with uncertainty in the face of overwhelming evidence. To choose uncertainty, to make that conscious decision of saying, I know that there's all these provisions and plans and promises of God, but I am choosing to look at it from a negative point of view. I'm choosing to look at it as an impossibility rather than as something God has asked me to do. That is what we're talking about here. A settled or persistent choice to live with uncertainty in the face of overwhelming evidence. Now, we do this all the time. We do this all the time. You, you, you've ever heard the saying before, don't believe your lying eyes? Okay, we are given evidence of all kinds of things in our society or in our family or in our choices, and, and the evidence is there in front of us, but something in the heart, something in the heart says, although it's there, although it's clear, although I can see it with my own eyes, I'm not going to trust what I'm seeing. And I know that we're in a political season right now, and these things get thrown around all the time. Um, and I do want to mention just briefly in the context of this, because obviously every two years there's this great big election. Uh, friends, I think it's important to do your civic responsibility, but I want to tell you this. No election, let, let's say everything in the, I, the, the rhetoric of elections is so crazy these days. Everything always hangs on this election. The, the, the country's going to die if the election doesn't go the right way, right? You've heard that? I hear that all the time. If we don't get the right results of this election, oh man, the, the country's over, life is over, it's all this hyperbole. I want to tell you something. Um, I, again, do your civic duty. I'm not saying you shouldn't be involved in politics, but no, let's say everything goes perfectly in the election. Will the election solve the issues of sin in our world? This is the shiny object that the devil sometimes tries to use to say, look at this over here while he's trying to get you to forget what's going on over here. What happens in this place, what we do as a community, as a people, the things that we're trying to accomplish as the people of God, that is where our primary focus needs to be. Amen? So again, do your civic duty. Be interested in civics and, and, and elections and all that. But... Um, Again, avoid the temptation to make elections and politics the answer to everything that we need. It's not. It's not. This is the answer. The Word of God, the plan of God. So, um, and, and so a lot of what happens in, in, in our political system, don't believe your lying eyes. Everything's fine or everything's terrible, right? Depending on which perspective you're looking at. But... Uh, in the Christian walk, we, want, we need to be aware of how doubt is uh, affecting our ability to see and pursue God's plan. So open your Bibles to Numbers 13. If you have your Bibles with you, I'll put some highlights on the screen, but we're going to be looking at the Scriptures um, directly here. Numbers 13, we're going to look at um, uh, a selection of passages here that reminds us of where we're at in the story. Numbers 13 and the first 24 verses, not going to read them all, but this is where the section uh, begins. Beginning in verse 1, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, send out men for yourselves so that they may spy out the land of Canaan, which I'm going to give to the sons of, your, of Israel. Send a man from each of their father's tribe, everyone a leader among them. Now from Numbers' perspective, it was the community's decision to send spies. From Deuteronomy's perspective though, um, it was God's plan to send spies. So you have this, this idea that God is allowing, permitting, or even uh, 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 suggesting that it's positive that the spies go out. Now, we have to understand that um, this was an initial test of the Lord. He could have just said, don't send out spies, just everyone cross the river, go over there, and it's all going to be fine. But he wanted them to understand that there was some um, problems within their community. God was testing Israel by allowing them to send out the spies. That's the bottom line. He was testing Israel, and we'll come back and talk about that from a little bit. So um, the 12 spies are listed there through verse 16. 
um, when verse 17 picks up. When Moses sent them to spy out, uh, out the land of Canaan, he said to them, go into the country of the Negev and then into the hill country. See what the land is like, whether the people who live in it are strong or weak, whether they're few or many. How is the land in which they live? Is it good or bad? How are the cities? Are they open or are they fortified? How is the land? Is it fat or lean? Are there trees in it or not? Make an effort to get some of the fruit of the land. Now, the t- now this was the time of the uh, grape harvest. So they went up and spied out the land from the wilderness of Zin as far as Rehob to Lebo Hamath. And when they'd gone into the Negev, they came to Hebron, and they saw the different descendants there, including those of Anak. We'll talk about that. And then they came back carrying the cluster of grapes. I'm going quick. Is that too quick? You were with me, with me in the story here. So they go into the land, and they find that cluster of grapes. And, and it says they carried a single cluster of grapes between two poles. The same language is used for the priests that carry the Ark of the Covenant between the poles. The same, uh, same uh, verbal language is used there. So they come back and uh, they have the results of their, their thing. So I uh, just want to recap the story. This is a test. And, and it's not a test because God is concerned about, you know, uh, whether or not they, they are, are ready for this or not. This is a test for them to find out if they're ready or not. When you go to your doctor and you say, doctor, I'm not feeling well, and I'm, I'm concerned that there's a problem here. And the doctor says, well, let me order some tests. Are the purpose of the tests for the doctor's benefit or for your benefit? Well, they're kind of for both because the doctor needs to know how to treat you. But ultimately, it's for your benefit. Uh, when your teachers, students, give you a test, is it for your benefit or is it for the teacher's benefit? Well, again, it's kind of for both because a teacher needs to know, am I doing well as a teacher? But ultimately, it's to see if you are learning the material. So when God tests them, it's not because God needed to learn something or have something. He needed them to learn something about themselves. They have been struggling every step of the way from Mount Sinai to this point. And before God can let them go into the promised land, before He can let them go up and become that kingdom of priests that God wanted them to be and establish themselves, they needed to see something about themselves. So Moses instructs them, he says, go and limit your inspection to the southern part of Canaan and the land. Uh, They violated that, by the way. And notice this, Moses was not asking them to spy out the land to see if they were able to to be successful or what their chances of success were. He wanted them to go into the land so they could form their strategy. So the purpose of the spies was not to go in to see, are we able to do it, but how are we going to do it, all right? So then they return, and then in verse 25, you get the report. When they return from spying out the land at the end of 40 days, they spend 40 days uh, spying out the land, They proceeded to come to Moses and Aaron and all the congregation of the sons of Israel, and they brought back word to them to the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told them, we went into the land that you sent us, and it certainly does flow with milk and honey. And look, this is its fruit. Nevertheless, the people who live in the land are strong. The cities are fortified. They're very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. Now, we don't know who that is. We don't know what they mean by that. There are different... uh, uh, scholars and commentaries that, that try to establish who Anak was. Um, there was an Egyptian word that could be pronounced Anak that seemed to refer to a warrior race that sometimes annoyed Egypt. So they're thinking maybe this was a reference. They saw some of the descendants of that warrior race um, in, in, uh, in Canaan. But the, the same root word used to translate Anak is used other, where in the, other places in the Bible to mean long-necked. So maybe it's a reference to them being long, tall people. Again, I just wanted you to know, we don't really know who the sons of Anak were, but they're awfully concerned about them being there. Verse 29, Amalek is living in the land of the Negev. The Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites are living in the hill country, and the Canaanites are living by the sea and by the side of the Jordan. Do you know who the Canaanites are? Probably the Philistines. We're not totally sure. But that's probably one of the earlier references to the first interaction of Israel with the Philistines. The Philistines were known to the Egyptians. They're referenced in the book of Genesis. The Philistines play a large and significant role, obviously, as we know, in the later history of Israel. So when they reference the Canaanites, it's probably the Philistines, but we're not 100% sure. But when it talks about the giants, where where was Goliath from? He was a 
Philistine, wasn't he? He and his brothers were giants. They were long-necked, so it kind of, kind of could uh, possibly be a reference to the Philistines. Then Caleb, oh, you got to love this. Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, we should by all means go up and take possession of it, for we will surely overcome it. I wonder what it was like for Caleb and Joshua on those 40 days when they were going throughout the land. Do you ever wonder what that must have been like as they're taking notes and the other 10 are like, look at how tall those, isn't that Anak there? Oh my God, those are powerful cities. And Joshua and Caleb are going, yeah, but we got this, guys. Shut up, man. You don't get to eat with us in camp. Go somewhere else. I can imagine that was a fairly interesting 40 days that they spent spying out the land with the other 10. But the men who had gone up with them said, we are not able to go up against the people. They are too strong for us. Wah, wah. So they gave out to the sons of Israel a bad report of the land, which they had spied out, saying, now notice this, notice this. The land through which we have gone and have spied out is a land that devours its inhabitants. All the men who we saw it are men of great size. There we also saw the Nephilim. Oh my goodness, the Nephilim. The sons of Anak are part of the Nephilim, and we became like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so we were in their sight. You ever heard the phrase, knee high to a grasshopper? You've never heard that phrase, knee high to a grasshopper? Uh, well, it comes from, no, I don't know where it comes from, but. Uh, uh, I just so, so again, I know I went through that fast, and I, some of you are very familiar with this story. Some of you are, 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 are maybe hearing it, uh, and it's been a long time. But the, the bottom line is, they come back and they say, look, this land, it's a great land. We see how wonderful the land is, but we got a real problem here. We saw the people in the land, and we think it's a real problem. It's a significant problem. Notice Caleb's lonely courage. Now, we know Joshua was also there, and he was probably supporting Caleb. But Caleb, in the midst of this this, uh, great uh, uh, negative discussion, he stands tall. This is almost like a Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego moment. It really is. Um, everyone else says, oh my goodness, awful, bad, we can't do it, big giants, ooh, we're, we're, you know, two, the land devours the people. And Caleb stands tall and says, no, by all means, God has given us the land. And, and where's Levi at this time? Do you notice that the tribe of Levi is silent? Who's the tribe of Levi? They were the priests. They were the guardians of the sanctuary. They were the ones that were the, the spiritual leaders of the community. They were the ones that were uh, assisting in the sacrificial system. They were the ones that would have, would have had great influence to say, hey, everybody, we happen to agree with Caleb because the Lord has also spoken and we are the defenders and the representatives of God. Levi says nothing. Levi itself is silent. There is nothing spoken out from the tribe of Levi to, to support the idea of trusting in the Lord despite what the circumstances might suggest. So you've got to really, really respect Caleb. This is a, a tremendous uh, uh, moment for this lonely spokesperson to stand up. Notice too, democracy is a wonderful thing, but democracy will not always be in line with the Word of God. Democracy, now again, the Bible says in a multitude of counselors there is wisdom, But he also says, do not follow a multitude to do evil. Democracy is a wonderful thing, but democracy does not always fall in line with the plan of God. And there are times that you have to stand as Caleb did or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego or many of the stories uh, in the Bible of those who go against the majority. The report gets even more exaggerated, and this is kind of fun for me. Um, When Caleb, you always know when your argument is weak, when you have to embellish and exaggerate. You, it, it just is. And you can always tell when someone else's argument is weak, when they have to get even more animated. If you have to scream your position from the top of your lungs, your position is pretty weak, right? If you have to exaggerate your position, your position is pretty weak. Um, I had a professor uh, who went to Arizona State, actually, um, and his, uh, his lead professor was Bill Deaver, an archaeologist. And he said, I always knew when Bill Deaver felt like his, uh, his position was weak because he'd get really red in the face and the little artery in his neck would start quivering. And he would pound the pulpit. 
or the, the lectern, I guess you would call and say, whenever, whenever Bill Deaver did that, he said, I knew his position was weak because he'd get so animated. He would exaggerate so much, and the little, the little, uh, uh, the little artery in his neck would start to quiver, and he said, all right, I know that you're, you're out of line here. But notice what the people do. After Caleb stands up and says, no, we got this, guys, they feel like they have to exaggerate. And this, so this is what they say. The land devours its inhabitants. I don't even know what that means, but it sounds bad. I, I don't know if it means the land is vast and so it's impossible to establish you know, yourself or, or the land is violent, maybe. The land is very violent. I'm not exactly sure what the land devours, but it doesn't sound good, right? And then they say, all the people, they, previously they just said they saw some of them, even the sons of Anak. But now, all of a sudden, now that Caleb stands up and says, hey, we can do it, now all of a sudden, all the people are giants. Even the little babies are giants. All the people are giants. And then this one gets me even more. Even the Nephilim, they had to exaggerate anymore. Important Bible principle here. Are you ready for it? Just because the Bible says something doesn't mean that the Bible says something. Did you catch it? Let me repeat it for those of you who aren't as advanced. Just because the Bible says something doesn't mean that the Bible says something. The Bible does not say that the Nephilim were in the, in the promised land. The Bible says that there were people who said that the Nephilim were in the promised land. The Nephilim were a race of people that existed before the flood. Okay, Genesis makes it clear. Even the Nephilim were in the land. We can talk at length about who the Nephilim were. They were men of renown and all the giants and all that. It's a fascinating thing, but here's the point. The Bible makes it clear. The Nephilim perished in the flood. No Nephilim after the flood. The Nephilim were before the flood, but they had gotten used to the, 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 the spies in order to exaggerate their position, said, Moses, you'll never believe it. There were some Nephilim who clinging to the edge of the ark. They were clinging and they were swimming and they managed to make it through the flood because we saw the Nephilim. Okay? Just because the Bible says it doesn't mean the Bible says it. The Bible says there were people who said the Nephilim were in the promised land, but there were no Nephilim there. And I, forgive me if you've really gotten excited about the idea of Nephilim existing. Um, uh, and by the way, I've read some amazingly curious uh, scholars who've tried to argue how the Nephilim were really there. They, and, uh, there was even one website, it was like BibleTruth.com or, or like, you know, it made it sound like this is the real stuff. And it goes to, oh, but the Nephilim probably survived somehow and da-da-da-da-da. And it's just like... <laughs> They exaggerated. They, in order to make their case, they had to make it as bad as possible. This is what doubt does. This is what fear and distrust and discouragement does. You exaggerate the position. Clearly there was strong people in the wilderness. And God didn't say, by the way, I want you to go into the wilderness because they're all a bunch of, of, of weak, backward people. And I'm going to show how wonderful and powerful I am because you're going to come in there with your tanks and your bazookas and you're going to take out the people that still have sticks and slingshots. Okay? He doesn't say that. He never said that this was going to be easy. He never said that the people there are going to be just uh, able to walk over. He said, go and figure out your strategy and then we're going to move forward. But they had to come to this point of great exaggeration. We became like grasshoppers. In college, I had a friend who was from uh, St. Lucia. He was from St. Lucia, and he had this beautiful British Caribbean accent. And he once preached a sermon on of giants and uh, grasshoppers. I'll never forget <laughs> Nayland Samuel's Sam, uh, sermon, because the way he would say, of giants and of grasshoppers. You know how things stick in your mind sometimes? We became like grasshoppers. What faith, what courage. And then as, as Caleb and Joshua uh, try to encourage them to move forward, they get so upset with them, they're ready to kill them. They're, it is a short distance from doubt to despair. And you see that happening in the lives of the children of Israel. These are the promised people. These are the descendants of Abraham, the father of, of the faithful. And yet they were unwilling to trust in the Lord at this critical time. And the Lord knew that. He knew they weren't ready. Doubt's disastrous results. Doubt turns God's tests into discouragement. We should not be afraid when we know that the Lord is testing us. It is for our benefit. But doubt turns God's tests into discouragement. 
Doubt turns God's promises into fantasy. Doubt turns God's power into weakness. We are not able. That's what they said. We are not able to go up there. Isn't that the whole point? They were to trust in the Lord. Let me tell you guys something. Without the Lord, you are not able to overcome. That's true. You are not able. But with the Lord, you are invincible. With the Lord at your side, you can do all things. Doubt turns facts into fables. Absolute fantasy. Doubt changes the reality and turns it into some fairy tale. It turns faith into fear. Doubt is contagious and infectious or virulent. It's it spread to the entire community. Doubt inevitably leads to despair and rebellion. And like the other negative experiences in the wilderness, it leads ultimately to death. Doubt. Now, last week I used an illustration from history, and I'm going to use another one today. It seemed to be uh, appreciated last week. And um, so I want to give an, another illustration of how doubt can be so disastrous from American history. And this goes right back to where it was last week, too, with the Civil War. Um, so I hope you like history. <laughs> In the fall of 1862, the Civil War had been going on for about a year and a half, and it had been absolutely disastrous for the North. They had, wa- they had won very few battles. They'd won no decisive battles in 1862 at all. It was so devastating that even the European and other world nations were starting to worry whether or not they could continue to allow the war to go on at all. France and England were threatening to recognize the South and force Abraham Lincoln to end the war. You have to remember that in those days, the barometer for military disaster was Waterloo. When Napoleon was defeated in 1815 and all the European forces clashed, that was the most disastrous battle known to, uh, to Western Europe at that time. Um, the, the number of deaths, the number of casualties, Waterloo was the height of military calamity. By the fall of 1862, the North had already experienced Three Waterloos. Three Waterloos had already happened in the Civil War. The Peninsula Campaign, um, Second Manassas, and the worst of them being Shiloh. And Europe was saying, this cannot continue. The bloodshed is awful. Not just Europe. Russia was starting to get involved. Russia actually sent warships to aid the North. Even in Asia, Japan, and China, there were many Chinese immigrants that had come over to help build the railroads and were involved in California. The Chinese were concerned about what was happening. Um, the king of Siam, which is modern-day Thailand, even offered to send Abe Lincoln a contingent of war elephants to aid the North, of which Lincoln politely declined. The entire world was concerned for the United States in this great calamity that we were in. So by the fall of 1862, you can easily say, now there were many dark days during this war, but you can easily say that this was one of the darkest moments for the Civil War. Abe Lincoln had already written the Emancipation Proclamation, and he wanted to publish it. He wanted to make it law, but he felt, and all of his advisors felt, that without a Union momentum or without Union victory, it would look like desperation. It would look like him saying, we're losing the war, and this is a last-ditch effort, and it would provoke more states to secede and go into the Confederacy. So he knew, I can't do the Emancipation Proclamation unless something good happens. So in September of 1862, the American Civil War was in some of his darkest chapters for the North. The South understood this very well, and so Robert E. Lee devised a plan to make his first invasion of the North. And on September 9th of 1862, a couple of Union corporals were walking through an abandoned Confederate camp, and they stumbled upon a coffee can, and inside the coffee can, they found three cigars wrapped in a piece of paper. They unwrapped the piece of paper, and they realized that they had stumbled upon what is known as Special Order 191. That is an exact picture of the order that was found wrapped around some cigars by those two corporals on September 9th. 1862, called Special Order 191. It was the exact battle plan of Robert E. Lee to invade Maryland. The exact plan. It gave locations. It gave troop strengths. It said where Jackson was going to go. It said where Longstreet was going to go. It said who the uh, rear guard was going to be. It was a remarkable, amazing discovery. 
This special order 191 quickly made its way up the chain until it got to this gentleman whose name is George McClellan. He was the Union general and generally responsible for most of the disasters of those uh, early days, uh, first year of the war. But he was the head man. When he first finds it, when he first gets Special Order 191, and you can see up in the corner it says confidential, and Special Order 191 is written there, and it's, it's all there dictated by Robert E. Lee. When McClellan first gets this, he gets very excited, and he says, finally, I'm going to be able to whip Bobby Lee, but if I don't, I might as well go home. He felt like this was it. This was going to tip the balance. His army was more than double the size of Robert E. Lee, and Lee took a great chance in dividing his army. If, if, uh, if McClellan had simply um, picked off each one of those five little groups that Lee had broken his army into, he would have easily defeated the Army of Northern Virginia, and the Civil War probably would have been over by the end of the year. But McClellan hesitated. At first, he was very excited, but then doubts began to arise in his mind. And some of his advisors said, I don't know, this sounds a little too good to be true. Uh, maybe we need to look at this a little bit more. Maybe we need to plan. We need to think. And for 18 hours, McClellan did nothing. He did absolutely nothing. It was 24 hours before he first made his order to get the army to actually move. By this time, by the time all this trans, uh, transpired, Lee had learned that one of his orders had gone missing. They didn't just write these out you know, like the leaves of autumn and give them out. He knew how many of these orders there were, and he knew that one was missing. It was probably General McClaws. McClaws swears that he still had his, but he could never produce it. So um, he knew that one was missing, and he got worried. And so he began to consolidate his army. And by the time the two armies met, as McClellan was almost always late in battle, they met outside of Sharps, Sharpsburg in southern Maryland, at a little creek called Antietam. And on September 17th, these two armies clashed. Um, uh, um, Lee obviously got there first. He was able to fortify his position and, and, and choose the ground. And on September 17th, 1862, the bloodiest battle in American history took place. Bloodier than D-Day, bloodier than Pearl Harbor, Bloodier than Okinawa or Iwo Jima, bloodier than the worst days of World War I, far greater than any war in the Revolution, Revolutionary War. On September 17, 1862, more Americans would be dead, dying, seriously wounded, or missing in action than has ever happened before in American history at the Battle of Antietam. After three hours, there were 5,000 casualties. After eight hours, there were 15,000 casualties. By the end of the day, 24,000 Americans would be dead, dying, wounded, or missing in action. By far, the bloodiest single day of military conflict in American history. Largely because George McClellan doubted he doubted that he had the right information. He doubted that he was able to do what was presented for him. And as a result, the two armies were engaged in a devastating and deadly conflict. There was a photojournalist by the name of Matthew Brady who um, got permission from Abe Lincoln to be the very first journalist in American history to be legally allowed to photograph and publish pictures of the battles uh, during the Civil War. So on September 19th, he sent his photographer, a man by the name of Alexander Gardner, to Antietam. And these are the very first published, uh, publicly available pictures of the results of one of the Civil War battles. They're known as the Dead of Antietam. They're almost all Confederates. They were published in New York. And never before, never before had people been able to get so close to the results of battle. The New York Times at the time wrote that Mr. Brady has shown us the terrors and earnestness of war, and if he has not brought the bodies and lined them up at our doorposts and streets, he has done something very like it. It's the, uh, the people said that the Confederates looked like they were lined up like cordwood. Most of these, again, are Confederates. They littered the field. They always dealt with the, the Union who ended up 
The, the battle was a draw, but it was enough for Lincoln to proclaim it a victory. But the Union was the one left there cleaning up, and they always, you always clean up your own soldiers first. So it took several days before the Confederates were dealt with. This is known as Bloody Lane. It was basically part of the first trench warfare. Um, and at first, the Confederates controlled it, and they were very, able to be very successful. But eventually, the Union soldiers overwhelmed them, and they were able to fire down the length of the trench. And it was an absolute massacre. The sides of the trench became so bloody, you couldn't even climb out of it. So much devastation and tragedy. This is known as the Lone Soldier. He's an 18-year-old Confederate. They don't know his name. He was found all by himself, far away from the battle, in the middle of a field. They don't know if a stray bullet got him or a sniper somehow got him, but he's known as the Lone Soldier. They estimate him to be about seven. Again, they don't know who he is. The South uh, retreated. It was Union soldiers that found him. They estimated him to be 17 or 18 years old, dead by himself, out in that terrible, terrible circumstance. One Union soldier said, if the horrors of war cannot be seen on this battlefield, they can't be seen anywhere. Now, I know that's a, a very serious and, 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 and sad example, but the thing that comes to my mind is McClellan had the battle plans in his hand, and he failed to act. He had the exact information necessary to be successful and to probably bring the war to a much quicker end. It would go for three more years after this. He had the plans in his hand, but because of his fear, because of listening to other voices, because of his doubts, he failed to act, and it led to the most deadly and bloody day in American history. Friends, we have the plan in our hands. We have the Lord's promises. We have the enemy's tactics in our hands. If we understand our commander, if we believe our Lord, we should not fail to act on what God has called us to do. We have a mission. It's called the three angels' message. We have an everlasting gospel to present. We have the character of God to establish through the understanding and, and uh, 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 living out the Ten Commandments. We have the example of Jesus before us and all the power of the stories and testimonies of the apostles. We have the plan. All we have to do is trust the Lord and not be afraid. Whatever He's calling you to do, solidify in your heart that God is with you. Solidify in your heart that He has already shown you multiple times in your past that He is with you, and He will be with you in the future. He's with you today. There is no need to hesitate at the borders of the promised land. We are almost there, friends. How much time is left? What is more important right now than establishing your place in God's kingdom? What is more important? What is, what is preventing you from taking that next step in your walk with God? He has given us everything necessary, evidence, evidence after evidence of His love and His provision and His plan. Don't let anything stop you, friends. Don't let anything stop you. Because doubt, fear, and discouragement always leads to devastation. God wants to help us be victorious in this. Amen? God wants us to find our way through this. I don't know what your circumstance is, what, what battle you're fighting, but God wants to help us. Ask the question to the Lord. Lord, am I a person obsessed with doubting? Am I a doubting person? Am I choosing doubt over God's promises? Am I exaggerating the battle before me? Am I making it worse than it really is? Am I a short step away from despair? He is able, friends, He is able to help us and save us from these devastating attitudes. Jesus tells us in John 11, 
if you believe, you will see the glory of God. I want to see that glory. And I believe we can see it. I believe we are seeing it if we look through the eyes of faith. So let's not be afraid. Let's not doubt. Let's see what God has in store for us as he walks with us and we fulfill his plan. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you so much today. And each of us has our own unique journey. And yet there's a, a, a common thread, a common theme that we are all called to be part of your last day movement. We are all card, called to be partakers of sharing the three angels' message. That we're all called to represent your character and to share with our world that you are the Savior and that you are coming soon. Lord, help us all to find our place in that message. Help us all to solidify in our hearts the plan that you have for our lives. Help us not to be distracted by any other things, even good things. If it's distracting us from following your plan, it's, it's not a good thing in our life, Lord. So, Lord, I just pray that you would help us. Let your Spirit speak to each heart because that's the only voice that really matters right now. So help us, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord bless you. Have a great and wonderful November day, already in November, and we hope to see you again next week. God bless.